Thank you for this opportunity to speak at the Mars Society meeting. I'd like to thank Dr. Zubrin and all the volunteers for putting on a great meeting. Uh, I'm Peter Merkel. I'm a professor in environmental engineering at Embry Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida. And I'm going to share with you a story that I call Sustainable Mars. And it's a story that begins uh, about three years ago when I joined Embry Riddle. Uh, and we'll start from there. That's our new Arts and Sciences building, and on top you see our new telescope. Uh, so we're an aviation and aerospace focused institution. Over 70% of our undergraduates and graduates are devoted to aerospace or aerospace engineering and aviation fields. But there are uh, traditional university departments at Embry Riddle, and I'm in the civil engineering department. I'd like to thank my dean. Dr. Grimorani for funding in space, my chair, also for funding for this work, and the Embry-Riddle Ignite program, which funds undergraduate student R&D, and the many civil engineering <coughs> students over the past three years who have helped me to build the lab and bring the vision of sustainable Mars to life. I'd also like to thank Donna DiLorenzo at Flagler College in St. Augustine, Florida, and the Enactus Student Club for donating space, time, and money for a community service project which is also being uh, allowed, I'm being allowed to conduct research at that facility as well. And I'd also like to thank Rebecca Nelson and John Paid and the staff of Nelson and Paid uh, for their technical assistance. So fish on Mars, what does that drawing mean on my sidewalk? Well, I'm going to vandalize the sign. <coughs> Don't tell Dr. Zuber. But next year, I think the sign should look like this. And of course, it should be to Mars in nine years and not a decade. Cool. It's my belief that to succeed in human habitation on Mars, both for exploration and for the establishment of a new civilization, that we must bring an ecosystem with us. Because we are creatures of an ecosystem. We derive services from our ecosystem, air, water, food. And unless we learn how to do this on Mars, I think that we will have a very expensive time resupplying the people who go to live on Mars. So that's what this talk is about, life on Mars, establishing an ecosystem on Mars, and succeeding in the exploration and colonization effort. About the money, um, what do you think the first clay pot made by a Martian child would sell for on Earth at an auction. <coughs> Isn't that a priceless object? But still, a Mars colony, eventually to become self-sufficient, will have an economy, and the notion of trade will be important. So as expensive as it may sound now, in the future, I think we should not reject the possibility that some mass transport back from Mars will be advantageous for Mars as a colony. Also, we have to admit that there may be things created on Mars or found on Mars of such value, not scientific value, but cultural and artistic value, or even individuals would become so important in the public mind that other people with means will seek to have them return to Earth. So I, I, I am not, I am I'm optimistic about the eventual prospects for Earth, Mars, commerce in terms of mass, people, artifacts, and uh, but my talk is about maybe a dystopian world where we might prepare for a situation where Earth-Mars resupply is disrupted. Hopefully that doesn't happen, but if it does, I think it's prudent to think about, maybe plan for, and start to execute such a colony that could subsist indefinitely without any mar without any input from Earth at all. Information, material, people, food, you name it. So I'll talk about some current findings and work in progress. And if you remember anything, remember this story. I'm going to tell you about the swamps of Mars. This is a story about the future. It's a story about Andrew Riddle University Mars campus, which I'm doing in a virtual way in my classroom and in my laboratory. But while I'm doing that, I'm keeping one foot firmly on the ground. 
We're working on sustainable food supply, education, a new generation of scientists and engineers. And in doing so, we found out that we can actually come up with things that are helpful today, which could be helpful on Mars. Two novel cultivation methods for, for two important crops. A master's student just graduated, Georg Olofs, found energy conservation method for food production. And we're actually using this paradigm, this model of a Mars colony food production system to reach out into a liberal arts community and generate excitement and even progress with technical education and understanding among the students who are decidedly non-technical. Here's a picture of Mars infrared from the Ingraville telescope. It's hazy, it's indistinct. And in one sense, that's part of our future. We have wonderful maps of Mars, but there's an awful lot we don't know. And there's the swamp in my lab at the end of last semester. And I'd like to bring the thing on the right and put it on Mars on the left. You see sunflowers, spices, tomatoes, peppers. How do we do that? So again, a different kind of colony. It's not the first colony effort. Perhaps the first colonists will endeavor to start to reconnoiter sites for it, maybe start to do experimentation. Eventually, we're talking about a society that's not technological as we know it. it probably, I hope, hopefully, it won't have computers. Uh, it will be a large civilization. Uh, it will not rely, again, on anything from Earth. If you can't make it on Mars, you shouldn't have it in this colony. Uh, flat screen, integrated circuit, what have you. Uh, it won't be there. And in working towards this future, again, to look at ways to create economic and technological benefit today is vitally important to keep bootstrapping ourselves toward Mars. And I'll hopefully be able to show you some of that today. So here's a, a very dense slide. I won't go over all of it, but my study goal, essentially my study program for the next several years, I hope, is to identify adaptive strategies and issues of concern for sustaining human presence in Mars environment, which is subject to multiple independent colonization efforts and cultural stress conditions. I'd like to develop and explore ideas for technology and questions for further study. And I'd like to engage undergraduates in research on Mars. Uh, if it's happening on Earth, it's probably going to happen on Mars, good or bad. So if there are multiple colonization efforts, sad to say there may be conflict involved. Conflict on Earth may come to play in the eventual survival of one or more Mars colonies. Uh, so of all the reasons why you might want to have sustainable Mars, uh, in addition to science, there's research involved. But then, at some point, this open colony may have to close. And it may not be by intent. It may be by necessity. Earth, Mars, transport fails. Um, how many economic catastrophes have happened? How many different things can happen to prevent that? Uh, I think we've all heard much about that in the last few days. So uh, one aspect I'd like to focus on just briefly is the social coherence. For this community to survive and thrive, to be a community centered on something other than the Mars aspect of it. Uh, there's a historical precedent of persistence of, of human societies in, in uh, difficult environments. So, where are you? Pop quiz. I'd like you to read this. There's fascinating cataclysmic geology there. There are high radiation levels. It's actually unsafe in some places. It's very dry, but there's ice year-round in latitudes. It's so alternatively very cold and warm in one day. There's wind and dust and thin air, and your habitat is harsh. You can see every star at night. This is where you live. You have nowhere else to go. Anybody know where you are? New Mexico. You're in New Mexico, sir. <laughs> the Taos Pueblo, continuous habitation. Over a thousand years in the same location, despite many, many challenges. And for the sustainable Mars colony, Think about some unique cultural aspect that might enable it to survive over and above just any collection of human beings, diverse as they may be. For example, an Aboriginal and Indigenous people who seeks to establish a settlement, a medieval abbey culture, a Mennonite or similar religious-based culture, an eco-conscious, intentional culture. Many others can be thought of. Where to put this colony? Well. 
someplace warmer, someplace lower, where the atmosphere pressure is higher, where some of the radiation is lower. Or there's water ice, you can easily excavate, bury out sand, adapt a channel. And here's some science sites, because you're going to want to sell access to the science that you are performing there in your colony. And maybe you've come up with a way to do small mass exports. You've got a, a little rocket industry of some kind. Uh, for instance, locate the first kimberlite deposit on Mars. What would be the price of the first Mars diamond brought back to Earth, especially if it had a unique color? And these minerals are from the Perot Museum in Dallas. People pay good money to go see these rocks, and they're from Earth. I'm sure people would come to see these rocks. Similar, what minerals are found in the caves of Mars? So the idea that economic resource can sustain the establishment of a sustainable colony, I don't think it can be ruled out. So where do we put it? Great new map from the USGS. Uh, flat place, maybe sandy, a lower elevation in the equatorial region. Why? Because energy is going to be a concern. Energy budget's critical. Uh, places where you can find things to study and find things to sell. What do we need from an ecosystem we bring to Mars? I'd like to point to historical precedents, water-associated cultures, the water water system of South America where water channels are dug and on the mounds between the channels crops are grown. Chinampas in Mexico, south of Mexico City, marshy land, channels dug, constituting a thermal battery so frost doesn't affect the crops at night. Floating Gardens of Kashmir, Polynesian Lagoons, where people have found a way to have intensive cultivation from their environment, which is sustainable in the environment. No additional fertilizer, no herbicides, pesticides. So on Mars, we'd like to have a complete human diet in all respects. Literally complete. Why? Because there aren't any more ships coming from Mars, coming from Earth to Mars. And in doing so, Let's avoid anything we need to bring from Earth. How can we do this without pumps, without valves, without complicated sensor microprocessors? What happened? We'll have to put in lighter, harvest lighter, manage the light, bring the heat, and harvest minerals, trace minerals, buffer compounds, and manufacture atmosphere. But we knew that going in. And let's not forget to bring our bacteria. This is nanotechnology of an incredible capability, bacterial assemblages, not only in our guts, on our skin, in our soil, in the sediments and ponds and lakes and rivers. We must bring the bacteria with us and learn to keep them alive. So the system that I'm going to talk about to help us do these things is called aquaponics. It's a combination of aquaculture and hydroponics. And this is the system installed at Flatler just this past April. Uh, two tanks here, 110 gallons, each with about 50 fish, koi and tilapia. And here are the tilapia the other day, took them out. I've raised these fish from fry. They started out in my backyard in an empty hot tub. Uh, and I moved them in the back of my car in trash cans with an aerator down to Embry Riddle and raised them in a system down there and brought them back. Tilapia are an excellent fish. I highly advise them as your candidate fish from Mars. They're almost impossible to uh, raise badly, very tolerant of adverse conditions. And students get really excited about aqu aquaponics, which is great because the Flagler Student Club took this empty air conditioning pad and cleaned it out and installed within three weeks uh, an aquaponics system and started growing crops. And it's operating right now. And they plan to turn it over for a small business for incarcerated youth to learn how to to raise money, to, to have, a, have a skill, uh, become farmers, become urban farmers. Aquaponics is a very fast growing indoor farming technology, but also in greenhouses uh, across the country and the world. So the components there, you see the fish tanks, there's uh, just some gravitational settling, uh, degassing. So you add, uh, add air, bubble air into the system to supply oxygen for bacteria, oxygen for the fish oxygen for the plant roots, again, in the form of air, not pure oxygen. And uh, keep the, maintain the temperature warm, keep the pH neutral, pH 7, and uh, grow crops without pesticides, herbicides, or uh, fertilizer. Because the fish waste is converted by the bacteria from ammonium forms to nitrate, which the plants take up directly. 
So down at Ember Riddle, my intrepid students, Bjorn Olofs on the left, my master's student, and Anjali Scott. We took this corner, which was given to us in the structural lab for our environmental lab, and we did the same thing. We turned that 18 by 22 foot space into an indoor swamp, and Bjorn built her master's thesis uh, uh, set up here, looking at a novel energy conservation method. So, science on the cheap, engineering. There's the, the final setup uh, at the end of last semester. Basil growing here in these two, and a variety of crops in the other. Over uh, <coughs> 40 pounds of fish growing in about 100 gallons of water in the system. Perfectly healthy. And Bjorn just completed her thesis. This was a thesis to look at a way to eliminate a component from a system. A typical aquaponic system has a water pump and an air pump, but using a airlift to move water around the system, the water pump was eliminated entirely, which was about half the electrical burden. And then, by intermittently operating the air pump, recognizing that the oxygen solubility in water would give you a buffer time where you could turn the air pump off, we were able to reduce the electrical consumption for this system by 75% over a standard configuration using an air pump and a water pump. So 15 minute on and off cycle, uh, and this was the growth experience, uh, the intermittent grow, grow bed one, 50, almost 60% growth from intermittent air on and off, and the control grew 25% per kilowatt hour, so for the same amount of electricity, uh, observed higher growth in the first two weeks, then a, a week where both beds were run continuously, and then the last four weeks, at this point the plants were mature and not really uh, growing rapidly. But really the point of this experiment was, uh, it was a mechanical engineering thesis actually, and uh, energy conservation was the point of it, and ideally none of the plants would suffer from the intermittent condition. And uh, I think we cannot reject that this is going to be a workable technique. So again, intensive fish cultivation from live fry to a diet item, plate size, sushi quality, in 30 weeks. Uh, again, tolerate poor water quality uh, and crowding. And they'll eat just about anything. And seed to a lettuce head in about 50 days. The unit operations we need to move to Mars, settle out the solid fish waste, allow the bacteria to perform nitrification, convert ammonia to nitrate, and degas, trace gases, that hydrogen sulfide, methane, that might affect, affect plant growth. And this is uh, an example of why this works so well, why plants do so well. They, don't, they have a different root formation. This is actually the root of a tree called Moringa olefra, uh, which is a tropical tree that uh, provides complete protein and a wide array of vitamins. And this is not the normal root form for Moringa in a soil. It forms more like a tap root. Uh, it's usually dry soil. The literature will say that this plant cannot tolerate wet conditions. Don't overwater it. It will die. And yes, in soil it will be very stressed by overwatering. And yet here it is growing in water continuously. And I, I think this is the first report of this crop being grown. I mean, this was grown aquaponically in a raft indoors at Embry Riddle, brought up and planted here. And this was growth uh, in the raft at, uh, at Flagler uh, over the last uh, six weeks or so. Another aspect is there's solid waste that needs to be flushed and dealt with periodically, a few times a week. We flush that out to the ground and irrigate the tomato. So the idea is establishing a nutrient cycle. Now, when we're on Mars, we won't be able to buy fish food, so what will we do? We'll have to go back up the supply chain, and I'll talk about that later. This is, again, Moringa, germinated and grown in grass. Uh, this picture taken a few days ago, July 10th, germinated seed. Moringa can be cut and harvested regularly, grows back up. Uh, and the, up at the top right here is a uh, Moringa tree that uh, the original one I showed you, which is over now, now almost uh, seven feet tall. My students, these were all, these moringa were grown in the lab completely. Uh, you see the root formations there, grown from seed indoors. Um, so with trees and water, let's grow trees on Mars, okay? So here's another one we grew, candlebush, which is a medicinal plant native to Central America. Uh, with wood on Mars, the wood products industry 
is uh, an amazing industry where products from wood can be used for an incredible variety of useful items, adhesives, uh, catalysts, uh, fermentation of methanol, which is an important chemical feedstock, to make activated carbon for filtration. You make wood on bars, you can make a lot of useful forms. You can establish a, a cycle like the mulberry to silkworm to fish cycle, which is done on Earth, where the droppings from the caterpillars go into the water, fertilize, and, and you can grow multiple species in one cycle. And with silk, you can get fabric and clothing, textiles, filtration materials, fiber reinforcement for, from plastics, you can make cellulosic plastics. Then you can make your own Mars suit, because again, on Mars, you're going to have to make your own suit. There aren't any more ships coming from Earth, and you don't know how long that's going to be. Okay? So here's the Moringa plantation. Uh, Sonata, a lot of the cannabis tree, again, transplantable to soil without loss. So eventually, when you get to the dome state on Mars, and you have a Martian soil that you've remediated, you removed the toxic things that are in the Mars soil, you can grow Earth crops there. You can do that. There are antifungal properties to extracts of the can bush, which are going to be important too for combined environments on Mars. Again, you won't be able to go to the pharmaceutical store to buy medicine. You'll have to grow your own. Uh, and the uh, supplements that are needed from fish feed in an aquaponic system, trace amounts, trace amounts of iron, calcium and magnesium, a buffer capacity, because the bacteria generate acid as they do nitrification, so the pH will tend to drop, will drop as low below six, and you want to keep it as much as you can at seven. Uh, it's a trade-off between the comfort zone of the fish and the comfort zone of most plants. And you don't have to worry about pollination because this plant propagates by cuttings. There's the outdoor system again, just some pictures I'll flow through here. And I transplanted the candle bush to my yard once it got too big. And there's the large moringa growing in or after there. So it's a diet item. The smoothie every morning, bacon into sauces, uh, salads, uh, an incredible plant. It's also called the miracle tree, uh, the drumstick tree, the horseradish tree. Uh, it's, a great, it's, a, it's a great thing to take to Mars. I highly recommend it. So how do we get it to Mars? I say we take an ecotube, make an ecotube. Again, on my sidewalk, excuse my art. But imagine floating rafts inside of a tube. It's a lava tube. You spray the inside of a lava tube with a plastic you made from your in situ resource utilization plan. You've made water, you put it in there. You brought some tilapia from Mars, which are okay because you have your tether gravity system. You had a Mars G as you were on your way. And you brought some drumstick seed, and you're off to the races. Now, you have some sediment. Maybe you could have worms in the sediment. The fish will eat the worms. So this is sort of like the vision of it. But in reality, you have to do a food web that's a little bit more complicated. And we'd like to bring a complete food web for stability. Invertebrates, worms, polychaetes, mollusks like clams, and all the bacteria that are, are needed. In the water column, you can have multiple fish species and micro uh, things like copepods, microalgae. And have separate zones because you don't want things sort of eating each other to death. And then the crops and the trees on the rafts, think of the things you could have. Very useful products like industrial hemp, medicinals. Now, you want the system to be oxygen neutral. You want to sort of let it create as much oxygen as it consumes, at least, if not give off a surplus. And you need a multi-zone structure where it's oxic, hypoxic, anoxic. So you have all the different diagenetic processes necessary for a nutrient cycle, just as you have in the sediment of a pond, in an estuary, the most productive ecosystems in the world, estuary environments, where bacteria are just working overtime to cycle nutrients or organic carbon. So these sediment and microbial processes are integral. And I'd like it to be dynamically stable without a lot of intervention from a farmer. I'd like to go away for a week and not worry about it, just like I leave my aquaponic system alone for a week. I know the pH is going to go down. Yes, I could probably set up an automatic system to adjust it, but it'll be okay. And so with a minimal amount of effort, have a great deal of return. So the ecotube types and cross-section, have a fish only, where you just have fish. Have raft crops only, because the fish will eat the roots. And have it be oxen. And then have a zone where you have 
cultivation of smaller animals and copepods and invertebrates with sediment building up, because you're going to generate sediment, your own waste, human waste, compost waste, you have to put it somewhere, you have to treat it, you just put it in there. The bacteria will take care of it with oxygen. And now here's an actual treatment unit, just a tube that's closed off without, use up oxygen if you like, just let it process and digest. It'll actually generate methane and hydrogen and other things. And this is just an atmosphere tube. It's an atmosphere with compost on its way to becoming soil. And finally over here is where we need to develop the back end of the food chain. What do we feed the fish? And this is where we bring insects and flies and worms to digest the compost. <coughs> so with a inventory of organic matter and suitable inputs of light and oxygen and space and water, we bring enough biology so that it runs by itself. Biology is an emergent system. We just need to bring enough of it and give it the right conditions and it will self-assemble because it's self-assembled here. So what it does on Earth. Dig a hole in your yard, fill it with water, and watch what happens. Spontaneous generation is not an implausible theory. You think about it, right? I love it. So what does this look like on Mars? Put the hab in the middle. There's a crew hub. Guess what? You can go for a run now on Mars. You can take a canoe. Go for a canoe through the swamp. Psychological space is going to be very important. Greenery has a tremendous psychological benefit for people. I would love for the people on Mars to have greenery. Plants and fish and animals. If you have fish, you can have cats. Bring a cat to <laughs> So one ring, crop ring, waste ring, what have you. Five different rings to the five different zones. I call this a Zubrin module. This is the land store array. As your hab grows, a common channel, this could be dry land, this could be you start to dome it over a little bit, dome over a passage. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight habs, every one self sufficient. Because every once in a while, one of them's going to go wrong, so you'll turn it off and isolate it, fix it, run it, live off the rest. And here's the sustainable cars modeling number one in August 2055. Population of 137. Well, why not? What else are you going to do on Mars, right? <laughs> Looking at rocks lasts so long, and I know I've done it. <laughs> Picks and shovels. Picks and shovels. And here they are. The new canals on Mars. Did Schiaparelli see the future in his telescope? I think he did. This can be done. So, what are my plans for the future? I'm going to grow these crops in this year. Wheat, soy, rice, barley, hops, grapes, and mulberry. Can't grow hemp, but I'm going to grow cotton and some medicinal herbs. We're going to have some student projects, undergraduates, reuse energy. Put a solar panel under my lights. Charge up a battery. Use it at night to run my air pump. Scavenging more nutrients. Do a wall rack and have a solar-powered pump or a battery. Run water up the wall and have it run back down. And water some plants. Start to do that food chain to grow our own fish food. And the St. Augustine Children's Museum uh, is in the process of designing a new aquaponics exhibit, and we'll be assisting there. So there's a lot to do. I have some other findings here. You can look up my, my talk if you like. Uh, one thing, a Mars Environmental Treaty is essential because you can do things on Mars that wreck it for anybody else that wants to come after it to study. Even releasing your biological waste into the environment untreated could be devastating for future studies of scientific natures of all kinds, all disciplines. Imagine a biofilm that's everywhere you look on Mars that came from some colony and so on. Uh, people are going to want to do tracer studies on Mars. Introducing contamination into the environment, while, well, yeah, it's an empty planet, why not? If it's organic matter and it's a nutrient, just put it in a tube somewhere and save it for later. Let it freeze, it'll stay there and lots of room to grow. So, um, I think I've talked about most of this except the fact that, you know, this, this idea of multi-colony efforts at some point, self-defense may be necessary. Uh, hopefully not. I would say avoid nuclear power for this colony, this particular colony. I understand the current model is to have a small nuclear reactor go first. Um, 
Think about your information security if you're in the colony business. Um, your things hacked, your objects hacked. And let's ban terraforming Mars until the future people in Mars decide it. So um, anyway, I think that's about it. I'll take questions. Thanks very much. Hopefully, you can run this without much electricity at all. Yeah. 
No, I was thinking power, I mean for grinding and... Oh, you mean mechanical power? Yeah. Oh, sure, mechanical power. Bring it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, uh, the other question I have is, what about the, are you cons putting into consideration the environment, like, I don't know where you're doing your testing and research, but did you think about extreme cold weather? I mean, we know we don't have snow on Mars, but do you think about taking your experiment to a lot of environment to see how it reacts to extreme cold, extreme? Well, uh, actually, the idea, thank you for the question, the idea would be to keep this system warm as much as possible. Uh, aquaponic greenhouses are run now profitably as far north of Canada. Uh, there's, I visited one in Wisconsin where it's routinely below 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, to keep a system warm is important, especially tilapia reproduce above 80 degrees, so that's their preferential range. And plants, as you know, have different ranges. A lettuce would be a cooler crop. But, uh, well, since we know that um, fish are our experts in neutral buoyancy, and um, one about thirty-eight percent of Earth's gravity on Mars shouldn't affect them, has any studies been done in the ISS or with the possible effects it might have on fish? I saw something about some small fish brought up. I believe it was a Japanese experiment, oh. but I, I have not looked into that in depth yet. So. The problem, right? Yeah, I don't think they have a problem for some reason. Has anybody uh, tried real low uh, pressure, like uh, uh, three psi or so? Not to my knowledge. Uh, I know there's been a great deal of work at Kennedy, uh, old Kennedy Center, uh, in, in their con controlled environment chamber. I guess the difference between what I'm trying to do is to just avoid technology. We, we know that sure. mechanized automated greenhouses with sensors and probes and microcontrollers can grow food in very small environments. I'm sort of thinking of, you know, that's an awful lot of work to do with technology we may not be able to make on Mars. Well, at 3 PSI, we know we can grow. Uh, they, they, they've realized, they've shown that they can grow many plants. Um, and uh, you could, as long as you have a gas mask or whatever, you can work in, in that environment. Uh, but uh, I guess one, yeah. one of the other functions of the ecotubes is actually spare atmosphere. So to keep, to keep a breathable atmosphere at normal pressure, would be one of their side benefits rather than to have to manage a, a lower pressure environment or some different stuff. So the well, idea is just try to do more pressure is is more is a lot cheaper to do, especially if you're not doing it in a in a lab tube or if the lab tube might, might not look safe to uh, put that much pressure in because I would probably I, I think there's many different ways to try to go about this and we won't know how to maybe tackle it until we get two more. Uh, my thinking at this point is that the actual tube itself will be an artificial structure that's structurally uh, supported in some way. So. Uh, thank you very much for that very interesting presentation. Um, I wonder, have you ever tried edible insects? Uh, have I tried raising them? Who raised them? I have not tried raising them, but people in the aquaponics field have raised black soldier fly larvae, uh, or I've raised earthworms, uh, and used them, actually also harvesting mosquito larvae from the environment to have them put to the system. So insect culture is a, a topic that's being studied for aquaponics, because right now about 50% of the diet for commercial fish feed is wild harvest, which is, is uh, perhaps not sustainable. Without an ocean to go fishing on Mars, we'll have to, to grow our own fish food. I came in a little bit later, so you might have covered this, but I just want to know why specifically not hemp? Uh, it's illegal to grow, right? Not on Mars. Yeah, but I can <laughs> not, in, not in Daytona <laughs> Beach. But, but that's, that's the THC factor. Hemp without THC can grow. I, oh, yeah, but I'm, I'm not sure you can even grow industrial hemp. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't think I can. Polymers, you can make fabrics. Yeah, it's, make it's an amazing industrial material. Remember, World War II, hemp for victory, right? Yeah. Um, so hemp would be a great crop for Mars yeah. for all those reasons. If there are no more questions, uh, thank you very much. That was a great question and answer session. And a great